Welcome back everyone. Our next two video lectures are going to focus on vision. So one of the most important senses that we have. And as you'll see, vision is a very exciting sense and also one that's a bit challenging because it differs in several different ways from almost any other sense we have. So we'll talk about some of those differences and how they make up um, what is our vision and our, the way we visually perceive the world. So a couple definitions to start out. First, visual field. A visual field is everything you can see without moving your head. So as you can see from the diagram, each eye captures about half of our visual field. So we'll discuss about how this happens more in the coming slides. Um, but what you see is that the right visual field is captured by half the right eye and half the left eye and vice versa for the left visual field. And then at the optic chiasm, these two cross so that then you have all the right information um, that's processed in the left visual cortex and all the left information that's processed in the right visual cortex. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, visual acuity is how sharp your vision is. For humans, acuity is highest in the center of our visual field because of the fovea, which we'll discuss um, in the next video lecture. And it drops off some in the periphery. And then photoreceptors. Uh, photoreceptors are uh, rods and cones, and they are the light-sensitive receptors that transform light into neural impulses. So as with every sense, there's some mechanism that transduction occurs. For vision, it's these photoreceptors. So the visual system responds to electromagnetic radiation that we measure in quanta. So quanta is just the plural version of quantum, which is very simply just a unit of radiant energy. That's all a quantum actually is. Now each quantum has a wavelength, which is the difference between the two peaks of the wave. So from the bottom to the top, it's how great the amplitude is. Um, and we perceive uh, different um, light wavelengths as having different hues or different colors. So for light with visible wavelengths, a quantum of energy is called a photon. So a photon is the same as a quanta um, or a quanton. Um, the only difference is that a photon is in the range that we're able to see. So it's in this visible range here. So the eye works very similar to a camera in that it has a lens that focuses the image through bending light. The bending of the light occurs when an, the light travels through something that has a different density. And this process is called refraction. So you see this all the time. Like if you've ever uh, been underwater in a pool and you've looked up and you've noticed the light kind of bends in in funny ways, or or even if you just you know put a drop of water on a penny, for instance, and you notice that it magnifies the penny, all that is due to refraction. It's the bending of light. So when light enters the eye, it first travels through the cornea, which is this part here. It's this outer part here. Um, it's a transparent outer layer of the eye whose curvature is fixed. So it doesn't move. It stays the same as far as its curvature. And its purpose is to help um, Focus the light back on your retina. Um, and in case you're curious about this, the um, when you get LASIK surgery, the cornea is actually the part of the eye that um, they bend. It's what they actually change in LASIK surgery. So once the light goes through the cornea, it then proceeds to the lens, which is where the light is actively focused. So you see there's a little bit of bending with the cornea, but the lens is really where the light is actively focused. So a couple things to know about the lens. One is these muscles that connect to the lens, so above and below. These are the cili ciliary muscles, and they help adjust the lens, which allows you to focus. 
So this is a really important task because it allows you to shift from looking at something close in your textbook to looking at something in a distance. So that's how you're able to do that. It's actually these muscles changing your lens, changing the, um, the focus of your lens, so you're able to focus on different things. Now, as we get older, um, our lens actually becomes less elastic. You can't bend as well. And because of that it has a lot less it's a lot less efficient as far as being able to make this change. Which is why a lot of people need reading glasses later on, is their lens can't bend as efficiently and it can't fully accommodate what needs to happen in order to read. So that's why people you know, have to have the reading glasses for that. So now um, the process of focusing the lens, so what we just described, this process is um, called accommodation. Another important aspect of vision is how much light is let into the eye. And this is controlled by the pupil. So the pupil is, of course, the black area in the middle of your eye that um, is just a hole that allows light into the eye. And around the pupil, there's this colored part, and that is your iris. So the iris is the colored part of the eye, and this provides an opening for the pupil. And then there are also, eye, anytime your eye moves, which is a lot, um, that is controlled by the extraocular muscles. So the process of transducing light into um, neural impulses occurs at the retina. So the retina is this part back here at the very back of the eye. So that's your retina. The retina primarily consists of two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. Cones are better known than rods because people um, remember the cones see color. Cones are the photoreceptors that are responsible for color. However, there's more to the story. There are approximately 4 million cones in the retina, but there are 100 million rods. So much of our vision actually comes from the rods. And one significant difference between the rods and the cones are that the cones require a great deal of light to be activated. And thus, the rods are very useful for night vision. This is part of the reason why it's often hard to pick out colors in a dark room if you don't turn on the light. So you may end up with different colored socks. Um, the reason that you end up with different colored socks is since you're relying on those rods, you're not able to differentiate between the colors. Cones are located primarily in the center of the retina, um, that area call, um, called the fovea that we'll talk about. Um, and they're very helpful for seeing fine details. Rods, on the other hand, are primarily present in our, the peripheral parts of our vision. So we'll talk about this a little more in class, but um, in your peripheral vision, you actually have very poor um, color perception. We don't think we do because the brain fills in details, but it can be wrong. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in class. It's one of those things that's better to see demonstrated than to try to describe on a video. So how do rods and cones transduce light into neural messages? Well, both rods and cones contain special photopigments. Um, or Technically, they're special photopigment receptor molecules, um, which these are essentially molecules that just react to light. So for example, in rods, this molecule is called uh, rhodopsin, whereas cones have a similar chemical. Um, in cones, the molecule contains two parts, retinol and opsin. So before we begin, um, I should mention that visual cells are backwards in many ways from every other type of neuron. So as you'll see, so pay careful attention to the description because it's very different than everything else we've learned this far. It kind of works in a funny way. So at rest, um, both rods and cones have their sodium ion channels open. Now this differs from every other neuron we've talked about. So at rest, rods and cones have their sodium ion channels open. They don't have action potentials, but rather they have what we call generator potentials in accordance with the charge of the cell. So what does this mean? 
This means that actually the cell is always sending neurotransmitters across the synapse. It's just a matter of how much. When the cell is at rest and not detecting any light, it's actually sending neurotransmitter at full force. So when it detects nothing, it's firing at its highest rate. When it starts detecting things, that's where it actually starts slowing down. So it's kind of the opposite of what you would think. So how does this happen? Well, when light hits a photoreceptor molecule, um, retinol will break apart from opsin, which indicates, um, which initiates rather, a second messenger process that leads to the closing of sodium channels. So remember that sodium ions are positive, and thus the closing of sodium channels results in the cell becoming hyperpolarized. So the cell's charge becomes more negative. This reduces the amount of neurotransmitter being sent across the synapse. So light being detected slows down the firing of these cells. Um, we'll be coming back to this in a bit, but before we leave transduction, um, just review this and make sure that you don't have any questions. If you do, uh, feel free to bring them in class because this is backwards um, compared to what you're used to. So I want to make sure that you understand the concept. So if you don't, bring it to class. We'll talk about it a little bit more. So as we discussed, um, the way that receptor cells in the visual system work, um, they work differently from neurons in the rest of the body. So why is it this way? Well, the unique way the visual system works is responsible for three characteristics of the visual system. First is sensitivity. The visual system is extremely sensitive, even to very weak signals, because it's always responding. So it's not a question of um, whether or not it meets threshold, it's always responding. The question is how strongly it's responding. So given that you don't have to reach a threshold, even small changes are transduced. Integration is both a blessing and a curse. Since we always are getting a signal, it takes us longer to detect changes in the visual field, um, whereas auditory changes were much better at detecting. However, the integration of the visual information also makes its vision as much more sensitive. Lastly, as we'll discuss, the visual system works with a wide range of light um, intensities, so it has great adaptation. So the visual system can see a large range of intensities primarily due to two systems or two mechanisms. One is through adjusting the pupil size. So the eye can control how much light enters, allowing for a wider range of light to be useful. The second is range fractionation, which we've talked about in previous lectures. So much like we've seen in um, other systems, you have different um, receptors being responsible for different um, parts of the spectrum. So because of this, and because in vision you have rods and cones covering different intensities of light, you, uh, you're able to cover much more of the range and have much more of the range be useful for you. So because of these different coverages, you have um, a greater range of uh, sensitivity to light. So in addition to the mechanisms described in the last slide, each router cone can actually also adjust its own sensitivity to light. Uh, this is called photoreceptor adaptation, and this can be done in a few ways. First, photoreceptor cells hold calcium, which causes them to be depolarized. The photoreceptor cell can actually modify how much calcium is being stored or released. This affects the resting charge of the cell and can thus make it either more or less um, receptive to changes in intensity. So it can make it more or less sensitive. The amount of photopigment can also play a role. As we mentioned, photopigment gets broken down into two pieces, retinal and opsin, which sit off the processes of hyperpolarization. The amount of photopigment can actually change within the cell. Uh, when we're out in the daylight, we want 
the photoreceptor cells to be less sensitive, so we have less photopigment. However, in a dark theater, we need more so vision can be more sensitive. So switching between these two takes a little time, and it's part of the reason why you don't immediately have great night vision when you walk from outside in the bright into a dark theater. And lastly, related to the last point, the availability of retinal chemicals for transduction differs at different levels of illumination. At low levels, the retinal chemicals are abundant, but at high levels of illumination, they become increasingly rare. This results in greater numbers of photons to be required in order to hyperpolarize the cell for very high levels of illumination.